Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What we want to do in this morning session is to basically condense a talk of about two and a half hours on cancer down to about one hour. And to do that, we're going to have to do two things. One, I have to talk very quickly. And two, we're going to, some of the detail will be gone. The core of the message will remain intact, but we'll lose some detail in the process. Now, let me explain something to begin with. I am not going to prescribe or play doctor in this talk. All we're going to do merely is explore the theoretical nature of the disease. I think you will find, however, that in this act of exploration, it opens up possibilities for preventing and even reversing the disease if you have it. So let's begin by taking a look at the state of cancer in the United States today. Slide, Luke. If you were to look in the papers, you would see that things seem to be going incredibly well for winning the war on cancer. You would read things, for example, the diagnosis and treatment are better than ever. You would hear that there are more cancer survivors than ever before. I'm sure everyone has seen uh, on television over the past few months, number of months, Lance Armstrong, the cyclist who overcame testicular cancer. He's been in the news constantly. Uh, more people surviving than ever before. People living longer after diagnosis than ever before. Uh, that the discovery of the elusive cancer gene and the cure for cancer seems to be right around the corner. Things could not look better for winning the war on cancer. On the other hand, if you go off of page one to like page 30 and 40 in the newspaper, way back, you find different statistics that tell you a different story. For example, you would see that we're currently spending about $100 billion a year to win the war on cancer. This is hardly a number that you would expect to find if, we've, if we're close to winning. It's actually about six times more than the entire film industry spends and makes. It's a huge, huge number. It's one of the biggest industries in the United States today. If you read journals like uh, the, the February 9th, 1994 uh, issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association, you would see where they declared the war on cancer a failure. And I quote from them. They said, basically, the incidence of cancer is increasing in all age groups. No new effective treatments have been found for any of the major cancers. Now, things have certainly changed a little bit since that article was written. If you read in the papers, you'll see there have been slight dips recently in the incidence of prostate cancer and breast cancer, uh, people surviving better in colon cancer than ever before. But if you actually understand what these numbers are, they're hardly anything to brag about because you've had years and years and years of the incidence increasing. Finally, in the last two, you have a slight little dip. Only the medical industry could call this a victory. I mean, understand that. And these numbers are even more than offset by the fact that new cancers, such as pancreatic cancer and lymph cancer, are now increasing rapidly and have more than offset those numbers. Simple fact is that more people are dying from cancer than ever before. Cancer is now the number two killer in the United States today, killing over 500,000 people a year, moving to number one. And understand, this is a, a disease that 100 years ago was virtually unknown in the United States, virtually unknown. Um, if you were, and I found actually quotes from doctors going back 100 years ago, where they were taking their students on tours uh, through a hospital. They would find a patient with a tumor, and the doctor would actually tell the students, look carefully at this patient. You may never see another case like this in your lifetime. It was that rare. Let me ask a question. I want to see a show of hands. How many people in this room know someone or know of someone who has had cancer? It's 100%. Understand the disease has gone from so rare that doctors were not sure they would ever see a case in their lifetime to where every single person knows someone who's been affected by this disease. The incidence of the disease has gone through the roof. Again, from virtually unknown, it has gone up, depends whose numbers you use, between 800 and 1,700 percent in the last 100 years. Eight to 17 fold. That's a huge increase. Currently, the American Cancer Society says that one, approximately one in every two people will come down with some form of invasive cancer in their lifetime and half will die from it. It means statistically that if this half of the room is not going to get cancer, Everyone, statistically, on this side will. It is a huge, huge number. So what's going on here? We have two entirely different sets of numbers that seem to tell two entirely different stories. They can't both be true, can they? 
Actually, they can, sort of. Provided you understand, it's one of my favorite quotes, Benjamin Disraeli's quote, that there are three kinds of lies in the world. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> Next slide. Let's take a look at these numbers and understand the game that's being played here. Let's start with the fact that more people are surviving cancer than ever before. How do we square that with the AMA statement that mortality rates are virtually unchanged? Well, let's consider the fact that cancer rates are up 800 to 1700 percent. To keep the math simple, we'll round that eightfold up to 10, well short of the 17-fold increase. So we're staying on the short side, but 10 is an easy number to work with. That means 10 times more people are getting cancer than ever before. So if no more are surviving, you automatically have 10 more, tenfold more surviving than ever before. You understand? Just by virtue of 10 times as many having the disease. But it's actually worse than that. Because the U.S. population has gone from about 45 million to about 270 million. That's a, uh, about a six-fold increase. So you have to multiply that in. Six times 10 is a 60-fold increase in the number of people who have cancer, therefore a 60-fold increase in the number who are surviving. But there's the backside of the statistic that people don't talk about as much, that 60 times as many people are dying from cancer as ever before. Again, only in the medical establishment in the United States could you call this a victory. It's not. What about the other number, that people are surviving longer than ever before? Well, there are a couple of factors here. One is very simple. You used to diagnose the disease here, and then people would die here. They're now diagnosing it earlier here, and they're still dying here. But theoretically, you're living longer. Now, the statisticians say that they're incorporating adjustments in for that. In fact, they are not, barely, but there's an even bigger factor involved, people. How many people in this room take some form of supplements? The fact is, two-thirds of all Americans are now using supplements. They are taking control of their health. They are doing things to change that outcome, independent of the medical establishment. That never get factors in. So, what, what's happening? Are we being lied to? Are we being scammed? Is it as some people claim in the alternative health community that uh, there's actually a conspiracy to suppress real treatments from reaching the public? I don't think that's true. I tend to have much more faith in the goodness of people and the goodness of human nature. I believe truly that most doctors and most hospitals really do mean well. But we need to go back and look at our numbers to understand why we're getting this conflicting information. The first thing you need to look at is that $100 billion again. See, the problem is I don't care how ethical you are, how well-meaning you are, how well-intentioned you are. When there's a $100 million pie sitting in the middle of the table, and all you have to do to get your share is reach in and grab some, the doctor can reach in and grab millions of dollars for, for providing care. Hospitals get millions of dollars for building new wings to deal with cancer. Labs get millions of dollars for doing testing. The equipment man manufacturers doing CAT scan equipment, MRI equipment, get millions of dollars. A hundred billion dollars is an awful lot of money. hundred billion dollars is an awful lot of money to have a piece of. Did I say a hundred million before? It's a hundred billion. It cannot help but influence the equation. In what ways? There are three ways that it influences. First, there is no interest in looking for cancer prevention, only the cancer cure. Quite simply, that's where the money, that's where the glory is. If you've read the paper, You've seen they're always looking for the cure for cancer. Have you ever read a story where they're hunting for the prevention of cancer? You don't see it. It influences you. The fact is that we remember the people who find cures for things. We remember the name of the person who found the magic bullet to end polio. It's now 40 years ago. Who was the person who found the cure for polio? Sock. You remember that. But who found the protocol that said if you started using chlorine in water, it would prevent typhoid fever and cholera. Actually, it's probably an Englishman named John Snow, but no one knows that. The glory, the money, are in finding a cure. So there is no interest. Are there people looking? Yes. You just don't hear about it, and most of the money doesn't go there. Number two, any cure you find must be proprietary. Let me explain the economics of that. Currently, to get something approved as a cure, 
as a cure for cancer or as an effective treatment, it currently costs, and I think the last figure I read was about $240 million to run through testing. If you were to find an herb that cured cancer, and I will tell you there is not an herb that cures cancer. No single herb does that. But let's pretend that there was an herb that cured cancer, and you wanted to get it approved so you could sell it as a cure for cancer. It would cost you $240 million. But you can't patent a natural substance. So that means after you've spent $240 million, you own nothing. Dan Prater could set up his own shop selling that herb, and it didn't cost him $240 million. Steve Duncan is the one who spent that money. Do you understand? So that it has to be proprietary to justify the economics. And third, and I think this is the biggest factor of all, is any cure or treatment for cancer must be found from within the medical community. And you need to understand why here. You see, I think ego plays a bigger role in this than money. To become a doctor in the United States today, you go through four years of undergraduate school, you then go through medical school, you uh, are an intern, a resident, to be a specialist, you then spend more time learning your specialty. Uh, Dr. Brabham can probably tell you more accurately, but I think it's now close to 200000 or slightly over $200,000 that you spend on your education to become a doctor. After all this training, you are now the most elite healer, the most educated healer in the history of the world. You have at your disposal an army that is unbelievable. You can command nurses in a hospital. You have the entire mega hospital complex at your beck and call. You can order up million-dollar equipment, tests, martial labs to, to do studies on blood. It's incredible. You are a demigod of healing. Is it conceivable to a demigod that a little grandmother named Sadie Hawkins living in the back hills of Kentucky could come up with an herbal concoction that would have any effect on cancer? That possibility cannot exist in your mind. It excludes possibilities. So what are the consequences of these three issues? Well, there are three of them. And the first one is is I will tell you that even though it is possible to eliminate 90% of the cancer we face today now, and I will prove it to you in the next minute, I will prove to you that can be done. Actually, let me ask you a question first. If a doctor discovered a pill or an injection that cured 90% of all cancers, would you hear about it? Would that person be on the cover of Time Magazine, Man of the Year, and win the Nobel Prize? Okay. We can do the exact same thing. I can tell you, and I will show you right now, how you can do exactly that, get exactly that result. Let's think for a moment. We already said in the last 100 years, the incidence of cancer has gone up 800 to 1,700 percent. If you can take your body back to the state of health that existed 100 years ago, in other words, remove those toxins that have been entered into the environment in the last year, that have helped stimulate cancer, to put back the nutrients that have been removed from the food you eat, to take your body back to that state, then by definition, you have eliminated 90% of the cancers that you have today. Understand, genes are not responsible for that cancer. Genes don't change in a 100 years. It takes several hundred thousand, even several million years for genes to change. This is purely diet and environment. I'm not saying it was paradise 100 years ago, because there was high infant mortality. But in terms of cancer, if you eliminate the toxins that have been introduced into your body in the last 100 years and you put back the nutrients that have been removed, then you have that state of health 100 years ago, the incidence of cancer 90% less than it is today. And no one is telling you about that. Thank you. I will take nominations for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Second issue, it has to be proprietary. Well, no one will tell you that there are alternative, tre alternative treatments at least as effective as chemo now. Actually, not very hard to do when you understand how ineffective chemo actually is. Chemo is effective only about 7 to 10 percent of the time it is used. Understand, in many cases, like when it's administered in, in cases of advanced lung cancer, its effectiveness rate is less than 1 in 100. Less than 1 in 100. Something less than 30% effective is considered a placebo. There are many alternative treatments that have tested less than 30%, but well ahead of 7 to 10%. In other words, at least as effective as chemotherapy with no side effects. And no one tells you about those. 
In fact, chemotherapy, another thing about chemotherapy becomes significant, we'll talk about it later, is its effectiveness depends on age. The younger you are, the more likely it is to be effective. At around the age of 45, you're basically 50-50 as to whether you're better off doing nothing or doing chemo. At 45 and at 50, you're actually better off doing nothing or taking a placebo. Your odds of surviving are better because your body can't handle the chemo. Third issue is that, and, and I find this one an amazing thing, is even though you're paying for this $100 billion already, you pay for it with your taxes, the government fund studies, you pay for it when you buy any medication, you're funding the drug companies, and you pay exorbitant rates in the United States for your drugs and get them for a fifth the cost in Mexico. Um, you, you pay for it in, in office collections. Despite all that, you're still asked to go out and run in 10K races or contribute to your friends who run in 10K races to raise money for cancer. You're continually funding research that is producing results that the American Medical Association, it says, is a failure. It's an incredible situation. So, where are we? We're going to talk about the nature of cancer, but there's one other question I need to deal with first. I need to ask a question and get an answer. Does anyone in this room believe that cancer occurs for no reason at all in your body? That it's sort of the hand of God reaches down, magically touches you and says, for no reason you are having cancer. And that when you get it, it exists in only one area of your body. And if you get rid of it in that one area, it's gone forever. Is there, please, a show of hands, does anyone believe that? Not one person raised their hands. And in fact, not one doctor would agree to that. Why is this an important question? Because you need to understand, if you opt for any traditional treatment in cancer, that treatment is based on accepting that premise. Think about this. What is surgery? Surgery says, we don't care about the cause. We don't know what it is. It's irrelevant. We're going to cut the cancer out. And if we can cut it out and cut out all the surrounding tissue, we've solved the problem. The cancer is gone. You're cured. Correct? Based on the premise, it only exists in one spot. What's chemotherapy? Chemotherapy is the idea is we're going to poison that tumor and kill it. Nothing is done for the cause. Uh, trust me, no one gets cancer because they're suffering from a chemotherapy deficiency. <laughs> so the chemotherapy isn't dealing with the cause. All of the treatments that you're buying into are based on a premise that no one here believes in, no doctor believes in. It's just the best they know at this time. So what is the true nature of cancer? I will tell you absolutely straight out, cancer is fundamentally a disease of the immune system. What do I mean by that? I mean that you need to understand that every single day of your life, as part of the normal metabolic process, your body produces cancer cells, anywhere from a few hundred to as many as 10,000 a day. Every person, every day, produces cancer cells in their body. If your immune system is functioning properly, it identifies and removes each and every one of those cells. Why then do some people get cancer? Very simply, there are three factors that cause this, this whole system to go wrong. And I'll touch on them briefly and then go into them in detail because we're getting to the heart of the, the issue here. And what actually happens is it's more usually the three together than just one. One, you are exposed to toxins or outside influences that increase production of those cancer cells beyond those few hundred to 10,000 a day. Uh, we're going to go into detail, but give you an example. Cigarette smoke. Does it guarantee you get cancer? No. But it's a guarantee it increases production of the aberrant cells in the lungs, increasing the likelihood of getting cancer. There's a whole bunch. We'll talk about those more later. Second factor is that you compromise your immune system so it can't even handle the cancer cells your body normally produces. We'll cover those in detail, but to give you one example, a single can of cola, and I've said this before, soda pop, probably the single worst food ever created by man, but a single can of soda can compromise parts of your immune system by up to 50% for six hours or more. Does anyone know people at work who slug down five, six sodas a day or more? Has anyone seen kids walking around with 32-ounce big gulps? What kind of immune system do you have to fight the cancer cells your body is producing? Third factor is circulation. I mean, circulation 
in the grand sense here. And we'll cover this in detail, but it's circulation of blood, of lymph, and of energy. Let's cover these in a little more detail. First thing, what kinds of things increase production of cancer cells? The list, in some sense, is almost unlimited. We'll touch on a few of them. First one, radiation. We all know people uh, who are exposed to radiation from nuclear fallout, such as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or from Chernobyl, have a much higher incidence of cancer. Radiation causes cells to go aberrant. Sometimes, if the, if the dose is very high, that cancer can come quickly in a matter of weeks or a few months. In other cases, it can take 10, 20, 30, 40 years for that cancer to manifest. But the percentage of people who have cancer after exposure to radi radiation is higher. Well, what difference does that make to the people in this room? Anyone gone to the dentist and had dental x-rays? It's radiation. Anyone fly here to this meeting? When you fly, they say in a cross-country flight, I think you're it's the equivalent of something like five trips to the dentist for x-rays. Anyone happen to live on planet Earth? Because you were affected by Chernobyl too. The fallout went into the atmosphere, it came down, it landed in our food. It is said that the average woman in the United States has more strontium-90 in her breast milk than is legally allowed to be sold in dairy milk. We're exposed to it all the time. It produces an increase in aberrant cells. What's another one? Radon gas. Radon gas, second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States today. What's radon gas? Gas that comes up everywhere from the ground, natural gas. Some areas more than others. The problem is when it collects in the house. And nowadays, we're building more and more energy-efficient houses. That's a good thing. Unfortunately, they concentrate the air in the house, the radon gas in the house. Second leading cause of lung cancer in the U.S. today. Incidentally, testing for radon gas is very easy. A kit's about $15. It may take three or four per house. Less than $100, you can test your house. If you find it's high in radon gas, modifying the ventilation in your house will cost you anywhere from like $200 to $800. You could get rid of the number two cause of lung cancer in the U.S. How many people in this room have had their houses tested? I see maybe four hands going up. Understand, this is something you can control. I see some people taking notes. Good. If you check on the net, you'll find kits for about 15 bucks. Um, air pollution. If you live in cities like Houston or Los Angeles, the U.S. government came out with statistics said that your chances of getting lung cancer, if you live in the Los Angeles Basin are 426 times greater than if you live in an area with clean air because it produces production of uh, aberrant cells in the lungs. Viruses and bacteria have been implicated in the onset of cancer, the production of aberrant cells. Certain parasites have been implicated. Um, cigarette smoke, we've already talked about that. Here in Kentucky, that's certainly an issue. But cigarette smoke is a major factor in increasing production of aberrant cells. Excessive estrogen, the xenoestrogens that are now injected into the dairy cattle, into your meat supply, into the chicken, uh, that are in all of the plastic wrappings on your food. The exposure to xenoestrogens is huge in the United States. Estrogens are the only known cause of uterine cancer. It's a major factor in breast cancer and prostate cancer. Increases production of aberrant cells in the body. Improper elimination. Average American stores 8 to 20 pounds of fecal matter in their colon. Yes, I know there are doctors who say, uh, proctologists say, well, I've, I've been looking up people's rear ends for years, and I've never seen that concentration. Well, something to ask the doctor when he says that is, well, what do you give your patient the day before, the night before they've come in for the colonoscopy? A purgative. So if you're blowing out the fecal matter, it's not likely you're going to see much. Let's get real here. But the accumulation of that fecal matter in the colon is no healthier in your colon and no better for you than when you look at it in the toilet. Do you understand? It's not healthy when it accumulates there for days, weeks, months at a time. And those of you, a number of you have done colon detoxes know what I mean at what comes out. It's not healthy. Uh, colon cancer, now the single leading cancer among men and women combined. What else? Free radicals. Free radical production increases... Um, Aberrant cells in the body. What are the things that will do that? Well, rancid fats, plastic fats, the fats that are in virtually every prepackaged food you buy, increase production of free radical cells. Anyone occasionally stressed here? Okay, a couple of people occasionally stressed. Stress increases free radical production by 800% in the human body. You need to understand, I know it sounds overwhelming. Uh, drinking water, chlorine is a known carcinogen. 
It is in your water because it's considered an acceptable risk. Not necessarily acceptable for those small percentage that get cancer from it. I am not saying take chlorine out because it saves more lives by preventing cholera and typhoid fever. But I'm saying, and I, and, and I do want to congratulate the municipal water supplies because the water supply in the U.S. spreads less disease than almost anywhere else in the world. However, it doesn't mean you should drink and bathe in that water as it comes to your house. Not only chlorine, but there are over 2,000 known carcinogens in the average drinking water in the United States. Even something as simple as acid reflux, continual acid reflux in the esophagus stresses the tissue in the esophagus so much, eventually you get esophageal cancer. The list I know sounds overwhelming. It should tell you two things. One is hunting for a magic bullet is going to be useless. There are so many factors that cause the cancer. And number two, if you have a protocol that deals with all of these things at once, such as the baseline of health, which is designed to remove toxins from the body and replace the nutrients that have been removed from your body, with one protocol, you can deal with almost all of these things at once. It gets much simpler. Do you understand? Let's look at the second issue. What compromises the immune system? Again, the list seems very long, and in some ways it seems to parallel the one we just looked at. The plug colon. That fecal matter, again, causes continual irritation of the cells. It also basically causes a shift in bacteria. The beneficial bacteria can't really survive when the fecal matter is present for a long time. E. coli survive. It causes cells to go aberrant. There's also the issue we talk about beneficial bacteria of a state called dysbiosis, where you need something like 100 trillion beneficial bacteria uh, from in the intestinal tract running from the mouth to the anus. The fact is the average American has almost none. Why is this important? One is beneficial bacteria provide as much as 40% of your immune function. So why don't you have these guys? Anyone drink tap water? Chlorine is in that water. It kills the bacteria. It kills the good guys, leaving room for the opportunistic bad guys to take their place. Anyone here buy meat from the store or dairy from the store? There are antibiotics in that food. It kills you. Anyone gone through a round of antibiotics with a doctor? Did the doctor do anything after the round of antibiotics was over to rebuild the beneficial bacteria in your colon? All of these things cre create a state of dysbiosis. You then are functioning without 40% of your immune system. Is it any wonder that the incidence of cancer has gone up? What else? Dead food. This is the issue of enzymes. This, this is a wild one. Think about this for a moment. When you eat foods, particularly the foods people are highly allergic to, wheat, corn, dairy, with very large proteins, and they're cooked, they're dead, there's no enzymes in them, and you don't take enzymes with the food, you can't fully digest those proteins. That means very large proteins get into the blood. Your body can't use that for food. They're actually treated as allergens by your body. Your body then sends antibodies to destroy them. The antibodies hook up and create what are called, uh, with those proteins, circulating immune complexes. Your body is literally now defending you against the food you ate. The circulating immune complexes can even then deposit in tissue, create autoimmune disorders. But it means your immune system is occupied fighting the food you eat and is not able to deal with the cancer cells that are produced. Again, any wonder that people get cancer. All you have to do is eat more raw food and or start using enzymes with your food and taking it between meals or at bedtime so that it can go in and kill the circulating immune complexes. See, even something like enzymes can help you prevent cancer. Um, poor nutrition. I've said this before uh, in other talks. You can't make the same quality immune cells out of pepperoni pizza, beer, and Twinkies that you can out of good food. There is more to nutrition than proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. You can't make the same body out of that food. Essential fatty acids are essential for cellular health and preventing cancer. They're removed from virtually every food you buy because they go rancid so quickly. For convenience of packaging and convenience of selling, these foods, these essential fatty acids are gone from your food. And the situation is even worse because it's, it's worse than just having none. What you tend to have is you get one kind of essential fatty acid, the omega-6s, which are in the standard vegetable oils that you buy and that's used in all the prepackaged food. There's a certain ratio that your body needs when that ratio or that balance gets thrown out. And the American diet is about 10 to 1 out of whack in favor of omega-6s as opposed to 3s. It creates heart disease. It creates cancer. I'll quickly touch on some of the others because, again, the list goes on and on. 
um, antioxidants are responsible for dealing with the free radicals. You get those from fresh fruits and vegetables. I watch what most of you eat. I don't judge it, but I watch it. Most of you are eating proteins and carbs, not fresh fruits and vegetables. That's where your antioxidants come from. Your liver is responsible for over 200 functions in the human body, a number of them immune-producing functions. Most people's livers are clogged with fat and dysfunctional. If your liver isn't working, your immune system isn't working. Uh, impure blood. Again, we've talked about the issue of the circulating immune complexes, but it also leads to the issue of pH balance. Now, your blood doesn't change very much. If it did, you would die. But all of the tissue around the blood can go acidic. And the fact is, cancer thrives in acid environments. It dies in alkaline environments. Actually, 100 years ago, when they would perform surgery for cancer, they would throw a caustic in before they would close you up because they knew the alkalis prevented the recurrence of cancer. It's not done anymore. There's an issue associated with that, too, is that cancer thrives in low oxygen states and tends to die in high oxygen states, which opens up possibility for therapies. But that relates to pH, because the more acid your body is, the less oxygen is available. The higher the pH, the more oxygen is available. Pathogens, it's, it's, it, when, you can, when you have colds, bacteria, you're always fighting some kind of pathogen. Your immune system is occupied dealing with that pathogen. It's not available to deal with the cancer cells. Mental attitude, uh, Doc Christopher's line, most people need an enema between the years is absolutely true. There's an incredible correlation between depression and cancer. Lack of exercise, that has to deal with the lymph system, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. And I've already talked about soda pump. Again, the list looks long and endless. Again, that same set of protocols, the baseline of health, deals with all of these issues at once. And again, you can see why a magic bullet is not going to work. It's too complex. Let's go to the third issue, circulation. Again, we're talking about blood, lymph, and energy. Let's talk about each of those in a little more detail. In blood, we're talking about three things getting oxygen to the cells, getting nutrition to cells, and removing waste. Well, first of all, what are some of the things that stop blood from getting to tissues? Well, for one, what about when your arteries clog? When you have hardening of the arteries, arteriosclerosis. I know the doctors will perform bypass surgery for the heart, but that only helps right here. Every other artery in your body is clogged too. You're having restricted flow of blood throughout your entire body. Again, we already talked about oxygen killing cancer. If you're not getting oxygen to cells, it creates a cancer-rich environment. What else stops blood flow? Anyone occasionally tense? Oh, good, a very calm group. Okay. When you are tense, what is tension? How do you feel it? You feel tension in the neck. In the back, it's constriction of muscles. When the muscles tighten, it constricts the blood vessels. You have restricted flow of blood when you're tense. It stops not only oxygen, it stops nutrients from reaching cells, the nutrients the cells need to rebuild themselves, it stops the removal of waste. You've got to have circulation of blood. Next issue, circulation of lymph. Lymph is the sore system of your body. For example, when a macrophage kills a bacteria, it drops off into the lymph system to be flushed out. You have more lymph fluid than you have blood, but you have no heart to pump the lymph. It takes muscle movement, exercise. And the fact that more and more Americans are living a sedentary lifestyle is one of the main reasons lymph cancer is the fastest growing cancer in the United States today. You've got to circulate the lymph fluid. And the last issue is circulation of energy. In the video on scalar energy, uh, I think it's called It's All About Energy that I did, the first half of the video really talks about the fact that your body is fundamentally an energy system. Do you remember that, those of you who saw the video? It's an energy system. All of the things that we do with herbs and supplements is really to manipulate the energy in the body. You have to get that energy moving through the body and circulating to reach all the cells of the body. In fact, the whole Chinese system of medicine is based on circulation of energy. Chinese medicine says that when you have lack of circulation of energy, an area that doesn't get flow of energy, you have pain, you have disease. If you reestablish the circulation of energy, that's what acupuncture is all about, then you basically bring the body back to a state of health. The other issue that's key to cover, and we talked about that in the scalar energy video, is that every cell in your body is an energy system, a mini battery with a transmembrane potential. 
averaging for most cells in the body 70 to 90 millivolts. Now, let me explain that because I think people have misunderstood that. It doesn't mean that healthy cells range from 70 to 90 millivolts. It means that different types of cells in the body have different preferences that range from 70 to 90 millivolts. For example, uh, heart cells tend to be optimum when they're running at about 90 millivolts, brain cells at about 70 millivolts. Each different group of, or type of cell has a different preference. Some cells, it's true, are slightly lower. For example, fat cells, I think, are optimum at about 40 millivolts. Don't go higher than that. Thyroids, I think, about 50. But the vast majority of cells, 70 to 90 millivolts. The key point here is that when the energy level of that cell goes down, its transmembrane potential goes down to below 20 millivolts, cells tend to become cancerous. So if you can keep the energy moving, flowing into the cells of the body, keep that energy level up, they tend not to go cancerous. We'll talk more about this later. But these are the three factors that tend to cause cancer in the body. So where does it leave us? Well, let's touch briefly on the things we've learned, and I'll go back and cover them in detail. First, we should have a sense of why medical treatments, the standard treatments, now produce such dismal, dismal results. Results that the American Medical Association or the Journal of the American Medical Association said have been a failure. Two, we should have a better sense of why the vast majority of money spent on research is a waste of time and money. We should also have an indication now of what alternative treatments or why alternative treatments uh, can work, what we can do to prevent and even reverse the disease. Let's look at these in a little more detail. Okay. Why do medical treatments fail? Well, the first one we've actually covered in a little detail. One, it's based on the idea that it's on symptoms, not the cause of the disease. And it's because they don't know. Medical doctors don't know what the causes are. They obviously haven't heard this talk yet. <laughs> they don't know the causes, so they deal with the symptoms. And all you can do is get rid of the, rid of the temporary manifestation. If the cause is there, it keeps coming back. So it's fundamentally flawed there. But the situation is really far far worse than that. Let's talk about some things that absolutely blow your mind if you actually think about them. And I know people haven't, but it's really mind-blowing when you think about it. We already talked about what's one of the main causes of cancer, exposure to, exposure to radiation. So one of the treatments we're using for cancer is to bombard your body with high-intensity radiation to burn out cancer. There's a logic here that's mind-boggling. Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy drugs are some of the most carcinogenic substances known to man. Again, we're going to give you a chemotherapy drug to kill a cancer at the same time pumping your body with some of the most powerful carcinogens we know. What are the implications for long-term recurrence of that cancer? Not good, and we know that. It gets even worse. We've already discussed What's the one system in your body that defends against cancer? The immune system. What's the main side effect of chemo and radiation? They destroy the immune system. So you're really playing Russian roulette here, guys. It's like you put a bullet, you're taking a gun, and you put five chambers bullets, and you're spinning, and you hope you hit the blank chamber when you use alternative treat or when you use uh, traditional treatments. And on top of everything else, they're some of the most toxic poisons known to man. If you've ever been to a hospital and seen them carting around chemotherapy drugs, it would scare the bejeebas out of you. There's some special boxes. If any drop onto the ground, if it's left there too long, it will actually burn a hole in the cement floor. When they clean up, if you've seen them, they have to wear special uniforms. It looks like the movie Outbreak, where they basically the entire body is shielded for cleanup. These are really nasty nasty substances. Is it any wonder that they don't produce the results that we all wish they would? Next slide. Why is most research a failure? We already touched on that a bit in that most research is looking for magic bullets. And we know why that won't work because the causes are multitudinous. They're looking for a cancer gene we already discussed that genes can't be responsible for the 90%, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, 800 to 1,700% uh, increase that we've seen 
It could only be responsible for a small percentage of what existed before. So at most, the cancer gene will be 2 or 3% of the cancers we face today. And for all the money we're spending, I'm sure for those 2 or 3% it's important, but not for the vast majority of people. Is there any cancer research that's of value? Sure. It's not the main research, and it's not the stuff you hear about. But there are doctors working now to see if they can work with the immune system. Now, there's a concept. There's a concept to work with the immune system to fight cancer. Uh, also, my brother-in-law, one of the top medical researchers in the country, is working on a system for taking chemotherapy drugs only to the cancer cells. So it wouldn't harm regular cells. That would be beneficial. Would it cure cancer? No, it would not, because it doesn't deal with the cause. It would allow people better to get rid of that symptom, that manifestation. But if you don't change the cause, you will get cancer again. You would have to use a treatment like that again and again until eventually it doesn't work. Most research won't cover the issue, and particularly when you get rid of 90% of the cancers like that. It's pretty shocking. Let's now take a look at alternative therapies, the issues here. Now, there's one thing that I need to deal with first before we can actually go into these therapies. Because one of the things you will hear is, well, yes, John, if alternative therapies are so good, how come they failed every test that the doctors put them to? Let's talk about that. I will tell you that the deck, the way things are tested, the deck is rigged against alternative therapies. And it's rigged because of the fundamental difference between drugs and alternative therapies. Drugs are subtractive by nature. Alternative therapies are additive. They're based on a premise that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. For example, alternative therapies rarely exist in isolation. When people use laetrile, I'm not saying laetrile is good or bad, but when they use laetrile, it was always part of a protocol if you went to a clinic. There was usually juice fasting, vitamin supplementation, a whole bunch of things that were done with it. When the medical establishment tested laetrile, they tested it by itself in isolation. Now, I'm going to give you an analogy that explains why that is a flawed way of testing alternative therapies. But I need permission to do this. I've done this before. It works well. But it's a football analogy. So what I need is permission from the women. What I've got to do is find out, have the women here at least seen part of one football game in your lifetime? Okay, good. So you would know what a football quarterback is. That's all you need to know. Okay. We're going to test an alternative therapy. A rookie football quarterback, if you will. Okay? Now, if this were being tested along the lines of alternative therapy, the logical thing would be to take the entire protocol, the entire offensive team, the, uh, let's say it's Laetrile and juice fasting and all these other things, take them all together, the whole team, put them on the field and let them play against the defense and see how they play. If they score touchdowns, we say it's a good protocol. If it doesn't, it's not a good protocol. Make sense? Okay. Medical establishment says, and with some justification, say, no, it's not a good test. Now, the problem I'm going to have, and I'll explain later, is there are other ways to answer their, their concerns. But the concern is, how do we know that quarterback is any good in that testing model? For example, he could be a horrible passer, throw passes badly, but you have the two greatest receivers in the history of the game on the team who are making these spectacular diving catches, and even though he throws badly and is worse than useless, they catch everything and make him look great. Or he could have a running back who basically runs 10 yards every time you give him the ball. So all the quarterback has to do is go like this, and the guy runs 10 yards every time they march up and down the field and he scores. Gail, even you could be a great quarterback if you could do that. It doesn't mean you're a great quarterback. Well, what if the offensive line is so good that when the ball is hiked, the quarterback can stand there, have a cigarette, call his mother on the phone, and wait for somebody to get free? Kristen could complete a pass. So they say, we don't know that. The only way we can tell if he is a good quarterback is to remove all of the other things that might influence the equation, put that quarterback alone on the field with the ball against the entire defensive team, 11 people weighing three to 400 pounds, and say, hike. What's going to happen to that quarterback when 11 people weighing three to 400 pounds attack him? He's going to get killed. And if he can stagger to his feet and they say, hike again, he'll get killed again. Every time, he will fail that test. Well, you may ask, but John, how do drugs pass this test? Because they do. 
You're going to love this because this is where the phrase magic bullet really takes on meaning. We put that quarterback alone in the field with the ball. The only difference is we now give him an AK-47 rifle, the drug. When you say hike, he goes, da 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 shoots everyone in the imposing team, walks across the goal line, he wins. It works. Unfortunately, there are side effects. The other team is dead and the game is over. But he worked. How would you test a real way to test? A valid way to test that would satisfy the questions of doctors is to test the entire protocol. See if the protocol works. Then you can pull out the wide receiver, let's say the juice fasting, and replace it with eating steak and potatoes. See if it changes the survival quotient. If it does, then you know the juice fasting was important. If it doesn't, you know it wasn't. Take out the hanging upside down in an inversion bar and painting someone's feet with bat's blood and see if that makes a difference. If it doesn't, you know that wasn't important. So there is a way to test that is conducive to the model that would give you a valid result. Now, you need to understand that that traditional treatments are also subtractive in more ways than alternative therapies. They take options away from you. I already gave you the Russian roulette option. When you use chemotherapy, you are removing the option of using, building your immune system because the chemotherapy is destroying your immune system. You're basically going all or nothing with one. So it better produce the results or you're dead. Alternative therapies, on the other hand, are additive. In other words, if one therapy is 7 to 10% effective, again, at least as effective as chemo, although again, remember, anything under 30% they call a placebo and dismiss it. Now, I really wish they would play fair here, and they don't. Because chemotherapy is effective less than 30% of the time, technically a placebo, worse than that, a killer. And yet they still use it. And any doctor who uses uh, now, let me back up. Let me go to a different place. I don't, I don't want to say things that are they're negative here. Any doctor who uses chemotherapy on advanced lung cancer when the odds are less than 100 is ill-advised. Does that make sense? It's, the odds are so low It makes no sense. But you can find alternative therapies at least as effective as chemotherapy, and they're additive. So let's say you had one that's 10% effective. And then you added a second one that's 10% effective. They're not mutually exclusive. You now may have a therapy that's 20% effective. At a third, it might be 30% effective. If you put seven pieces together that are 10% effective each, you could have a protocol that's 70% effective, but if you pull each piece out and test it one at a time, each piece fails. You understand why this is the concept here is so key. So key. Okay. There's one other thing that I want to deal with here. And this one really is an irritant to me. Is the claim from the medical establishment that one of the reasons they basically look to discredit alternative therapies is they don't want you to be cheated out of your money. You heard that one? Okay. Okay. Alternative therapies, if you do them yourself, generally, if you were dealing with cancer, since most of the things are things like buying, you know, juice fasting and things like that, will run you 100 to $200 a month. If you go to a clinic, it might cost you more, 100 to 200 a month. You buy some specialized equipment, like a Rife machine, uh, technology out there, or Ozonator, and we'll talk more about those later. They may cost you $2,000 one time, much bigger. However, that will not make you go bankrupt. Question. Does everyone in the room, or how many people in this room, know some family where someone in that family had cancer, and that family literally went bankrupt dealing with that cancer following the traditional model? Show of hands. It's about half the people in this room. I find that rather disingenuous of the medical establishment to claim they're looking to save you money, 100, 200 a month, when so many people are going bankrupt using a therapy the Journal of the American Medical Association has called a failure. Disingenuous. Okay. Let's talk. We're now going to move into what do you do if you have cancer? These are not recommendations. I'm not going to do this from the perspective, if I had cancer, how would I think about the issue? What are the roles of surgery? Well, one of the things I would want to know, or, or 
where I would look to surgery is if there were a large tumor in my body that was impinging on an organ where death appeared imminent and I wanted time. Now understand something, and a lot of you know this from, from doing uh, pieces of the baseline of health or doing it all. Sometimes those of you who had cancer have reversed it very quickly in a matter of a few weeks or a week or two, done major reversals. So alternative therapies can work very quickly. But sometimes if you were impinging on an organ seriously, you might want to think about surgery to give yourself time to do something. It's an option. Chemotherapy, radiation, I would need second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh opinions. I would need to be absolutely convinced that the chemotherapy for the cancer I had was a really viable option. The other thing is if I were doing chemotherapy, I would absolutely want to be sure I was building my immune system at the same time. Now, one of the things that we do know is it's possible to build your immune system while doing chemo. We've done it repeatedly. We've seen people do this repeatedly. Numerous cases, there's one that I can think of just uh, comes to mind, is uh, the woman who had metastasized breast cancer. She was getting ready to start chemo, and the doctor was worried because her white cell count was down to about 2,600, about half of normal. And he was worried she would not survive chemo because she was already too low, and he knew the chemo would drive it lower. So with his permission, although he didn't think it would do anything, but he saw no choice, with his permission, she started on Immunity Plus, the immune enhancer, and trace minerals at the same time that she started chemo. One week later, he took a look at her blood, blood count. It had not gone down, but in fact had gone from 2,600 to 4,300, and a week later was up to 5,200 and held there for the rest of treatment. Now, we've seen that that can be repeated over and over and over, that you can keep the immune system up. It's not hard to do. I would say that any doctor who does chemotherapy, unless it's a specialized thing like leukemia where you're trying to get rid of the immune system, literally, to eliminate it and replace it. But for most cancers, to use chemo without doing something to build the immune system is on bad choice of words is going to come out, an inflammatory word, is ill-advised. How about that? Ill-advised. Now, I've got to tell you one thing. When we found out how well Immunity Plus was working, keeping the immune system up, I wrote to a number of hospitals, all of whom had complementary health programs or were working with the NIH to evaluate complementary health, to say we would fund the testing because if the results proved out to be as they were proving consistently, that it would keep the immune system up while you were doing chemo, it would save thousands of lives. We sent out a round of letters. Not one hospital answered. Not one. I sent out a second letter. I was persistent. Not one hospital answered. I sent out a third letter. I finally got one response. And I will not say which hospital, which doctor was the head of the cancer department in that hospital, said, never write to us again unless you have this in a peer-reviewed journal. Well, duh. What do you think we were looking for? Basically, he was saying, ha ha, catch 22. We won't look at it if it's, unless it's in a peer-reviewed journal, and we will never do anything to get it in a peer-reviewed journal. You will never get it evaluated. Anyway, I would not do chemo unless something was being done to boost my immune system at the same time. Same for radiation. What would I do? I would do everything. Alternative, because it's additive, I would do it all at once. I would do it intensively. I would repeat it. And then once I thought the cancer was gone, I would continue doing it for six months. One of the problems people have is they think they've won and they stop too soon. You keep it going. So what are these things that you do? Is the baseline of health a cure for cancer? No, it is not. But it is a tremendous way to defend your body to eliminate the chance of getting that 90% of cancers we're talking about, that 800 to 1,700% increase. It's also a great launching pad for doing any treatment to get rid of the cancer. Why? Because it removes those toxins from the body that we discussed that cause cancer, and it rebuilds the body, puts the nutrients back that have been eliminated. It is not a cure for cancer. It does not get rid of cancer. It is the launching point for doing it. Now, we have seen some people do just the baseline of health, and it has been enough. But you would never sell it that way or bill it that way or promise it that way. What are the things I would do on top of the baseline of health? And I'm just throwing out here, there's so many possibilities and you can look out. 
Some work better than others. Every one of these things, I have seen evidence that they provide benefits for at least some people. And understand, it's like the baseline of health. You don't know which piece is necessarily going to help you. So if you only use one of these, you're now, again, playing uh, Russian roulette or playing with loaded dice. You want to do as many of these things as you can. Well, certainly based on the studies by Dr. Daniel Nixon, which are now human studies, using red raspberry extract makes a lot of sense for a lot of cancers. And a lot of people we know have had great results with it. I would basically beef up the amount of red raspberry elagitanins I was taking. I would do things like curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric. It's an eradicator. I would beef up the amount I was taking because it's known that it prevents, uh, it destroys cancer cells, particularly colon cancer cells. I would pick up green tea extract and start using a lot of it. I would do things like stabilized rice bran, which has over 70 known antioxidants. Um, what else? Ah, graviola, which is an herb from South America, which in lab studies, in numerous lab studies, not human studies, but lab studies, has been shown to kill cancer cells. Ace Manin, we're going to talk more about that later this morning. That's from aloe vera, has been shown to have properties for destroying cancer and even AIDS. Uh, Antineoplastins, Dr. Brzezinski in Texas, has found a therapy that basically is very effective for brain cancer. Now, something here again, it's not a cure for cancer. It's dealing with the manifestation of that cancer. You have to keep doing it, or the brain cancer will come back. But again, that's why something like the baseline of health makes so much sense in conjunction with anything else you're doing, because it's working on the underlying causes. It's very important to understand that. Um, High-dose beta-glucans. We'll talk more about beta-glucans later. But the beta-glucans are things that are in the medicinal mushrooms in Immunity Plus, for example. A high alkaline therapy, taking your body to an alkaline state. We have the trace minerals, but I would be much more aggressive about it. Cancer cannot survive in an alkaline state. Unfortunately, the FDA has taken away your option or made it very difficult to get. You can still get it, but it's harder to get. Some of those things, the, the minerals that really can make your body alkaline and have no side effects, things like cesium and vanadium. And I would try and track down sources of liquid cesium and vanadium. Um, I would look for ozone therapy. Ozone is a way to get oxygen into the body. You don't breathe it because it will burn your lungs. You basically put it into water and drink it, or you put it into water and you basically take it as an enema and hold it. You absorb it through your colon. It gets oxygen into your body. I would think of things like Rife technology. Royal Rife years ago, the FDA hates Rife technology, hates it with a passion. Uh, discovered years ago that you can basically blow cells apart at certain frequencies and different cells blow apart at different frequencies. And cancer cells blow apart at different frequencies in health cells. Now, what Royal Rife did is he basically had a way of analyzing cells and could identify which particular frequency would blow apart your particular cancer cells. And they would basically use a machine to put that frequency into your body. Nowadays, they don't use that technology. They tend to use a machine that cycles through the various frequencies associated with the different cancers. Are they a cure for cancer? Absolutely not. But I have repeatedly seen them basically take people who are moving to a terminal state and stop that and hold that cancer at bay for a year or even two. But again, if you don't do anything to get rid of the underlying cause of cancer, you haven't cured the cancer. You've just gained time. And the last piece is the energy balancing. And here we're talking about scalar enhancement. Now, one of the things that we know is that when you charge the cells up, we talked about this earlier, if you basically take the energy level of cells up to that 70 to 90 millivolt range, they tend not to be cancerous. There are a couple of ways to do that. Uh, I mentioned when I did that talk on scalar energy that there are charging chambers. There are a couple of dozen around the United States and more all the time. I would look to go into one of those chambers if I could find one because you get a high dose, if you will, or, or a high boost of picking up the energy in your cells. You can get a, basically a good, quick hit but I would even be more concerned about taking lots of products that were scalar enhanced because it keeps the charge in the cells 24 hours a day. These are the kinds of things that I would look at doing. Yeah, are we talking about a cure for cancer here? And I'm saying absolutely not. None of these things are in their totality as a cure for cancer. And I don't just say that for the benefit of the FDA. I say it because it's not true. There is no guarantee. There are sometimes things you don't know. Sometimes it is just your time. People will die. They have to die from something. Some will die from cancer. The fact that you can remove 90% of the cancers 
is a tremendous benefit if you were going to be one of those 90%, right? But there's also the fact that, for example, if you lived in Love Canal, you could be doing the baseline of health, but you're dying from the water you're drinking. If you were one of Aaron Brockovich's clients drinking chromium-6 in your water in California, you could be taken the elagitanin. You still have a problem. So sometimes there are factors you just don't know. And then the other thing, and it's really important to remember this, is every day everyone has cancer. It's just a question of has it taken root or not. So when I see these ads of people saying, I've been cancer-free for seven years, it's not true. Every day, every single person produces cancer cells in your body. All you can do is help your body do what it was designed to do. What it normally does is find and eliminate every one of those cancer cells. So, summarize where we are. I do believe that someday, and not that far off, 25 or 50 years in the future, today's treatments for cancer will be considered barbaric, will be considered and derided in the same way that we laugh at the doctors who used to use leeches and bloodletting and putting people on racks. It will be considered barbaric. It's already being determined that it's non effective. As soon as they have an alternative treatment that works, you know, the medical science discovers something that works better, they will abandon these things and then criticize all of the other people who used to do these things because they don't do them now. The bottom line is you can literally get the effect of a Nobel Prize winning drug by literally doing something like the baseline of health that literally removes the toxins from your bodies, gives your body the nutrients that have been removed over the last hundred years, take your body back to that state the body was in a hundred years ago. And again, I'm not saying that was an ideal state because people died from other things. But in terms of cancer, it was. Clean out the body. Nourish the body. Do a program like the baseline of health. And a lot of it you don't even have to buy. Things like juicing have nothing to do with this company. Flaxseed has nothing to do with this company. Exercise has nothing to do with this company. Changing your state of mind has nothing to do with this company. Much of the baseline of health is stuff you can do on your own, virtually for free. Do it, and you can reduce your odds of getting cancer by 90%. Thank you very much.